it's me. I'm back. Back in the content mines for y'all. Mining the content. Slaving away. Uh, this video is a little delayed. I apologize. Um, actually, fuck that. I'm not going to apologize first. I'm going to start with some gratitude. Because my first couple of videos have fairly organically cracked 100 views each. Which, you know, I'm, I'm not really promoting this in... Um, you know, I'll, I'll do a post on Instagram the day of or something like that. But, you know, I'm not paying for, like, ads. And I'm not necessarily flooding the YouTube algorithm with, um, you know, reels all the time. Or the little shorts or whatever they call them over here. Um, you know, and I'm kind of posting kind of when I feel like it, when I get to it. So, to have 100 views for a fairly low effort operation, it feels pretty good. You know, I'm into it. I'm happy with that. So... Thank you everyone that's watched um, episode one, episode two so far. I apologize for the delay, but I think generally in life, um, it's, it's, it puts off a better thing, I think, if you show gratitude for, the, for people's patience and for their engagement with what you've already done, rather in this kind of context, rather than leading off an apology. So thank you for those that have watched already. Um, little noodle there for y'all this is my acoustic this is the Takamini. it's it loves to collect fingerprints it loves to reflect this um ring light that i'm using today i'm kind of experimenting with various production value type ads like using the the ring light and being in uh different locations of of the uh the casa as it were um so i have been quite busy which is uh, why it's taken me some time to get to this. Um, and I've been kind of planning on getting to this here fairly soon. If, if it wasn't gonna happen tonight, it was gonna happen at some point in the next couple of days for sure. But I definitely had to come in um, and come on rather and say rest in peace to Robbie Robertson. Definitely um, an influence of mine for sure. Um, you know, there, there are lots of guys that I draw from, but Robbie, and, the, and particularly the band are definitely people that I, you know, excuse me, look to as, you know, it, not that they necessarily inspire the art that I make, but just as far as having an artistic vision and executing it, you know what I mean? The band are inspirations in that, that sort of way. Um, I was first introduced to the band, um, probably the first time I ever heard any of their music um, I probably didn't even recognize that that's who it was by. Um, I was a freshman at Belmont University and I was, it was, I don't think classes had even started yet. I think I just was there, just like wandering campus. Maybe they had, maybe it was like a week or two in the first semester. And, um, you know, it's, it's a liberal arts college in Nashville. A lot of, a lot of musicians come out of there. A lot of artists come out of there. Um, even more so go there and try to come out of there um and there's this very kind of organic you know um kind of magnetism where you kind of find other people that you have similar musical interests with and stuff like that and you know maybe like you're the one kid from your town that's into whatever style you're like really into or maybe that you're really into music at all so you go there and find lots of kindred spirits and you know there's a little bit of everything for everyone there and so I, I kind of fell into more of the click of kind of like the metal, hard rock, progressive rock kind of kids or whatever. Um, but, um, you know, like there were lots of little pockets for everybody. And I remember um, there's this big kind of patch of, of grass between where my dorm, my freshman dorm was and where the school of music was called the quad or whatever. And I remember walking, I think I was, going into one of the, um, the music buildings for whatever reason, maybe to go to practice room and seeing a bunch of kids sitting out and and playing guitar and singing and they're all playing and singing along to the weight. And I was like, what is this song? How does everyone seem to know it? Like, are they weird? Or am I missing out on something or whatever? And then um, I ended up just kind of, you know, once I started working a bit and started having to play like actual tunes versus, um, you know, original material that my, my bands at the time were writing. Um, I think, you know, we had, we would play like The Weight, obviously, and Ophelia, 
and Cripple Creek. And so I think by way of having that in the repertoire, I kind of dove in a little bit um, and definitely got pretty, pretty big into um, music from Big Pink for sure. Um, and for me, I'm the kind of guy, like whenever I get to an artist, um, with, with a few exceptions, I generally tend to like really kind of hone in on like one record and like really focus on that one and and just kind of wear it out, you know what I mean? And so there's lots of really, really great Robbie Robertson moments on that. Um, obviously the way, you know, one of the big tunes is on it. Um, I was really like the tune Caledonia Mission. I thought I had some uh, kind of this funky little guitar riff and some cool kind of almost country double stop ideas. Um, and, you know, just kind of cool tones and, you know, and, and a pop, you know, the, the, the story goes is that that's the record that caused Eric Clapton to disband Cream, you know, however much say that he had over Cream disbanding, uh, you know, because I think, you know, a, a lot of bands at that time were kind of drawing from, you know, it was particularly a lot of English bands were drawing from, you know, uh, American blues, you know, Chicago blues and stuff like that and kind of reinventing that and, and playing this kind of blues rock kind of thing. And here comes this record that's just like, just not that, you know what I mean? That has this kind of more songwritery folk music, uh, you know, maybe a little bit of country music, um, you know, Americana, even if we even want to call it that. I don't know if that term even existed back then necessarily. Um, you know, especially not for a band that was mostly Canadians. I always thought it was kind of a trip that um, that uh, a band full of Canadians had um, probably the best song about the American Civil War. I thought that was pretty funny. Obviously, Leave on Helms from Arkansas. But um, yeah, I always thought that was kind of a, a funny contradiction. Um, and obviously, The Last Waltz is a big um, cultural... Um, artifact as well um, the, the the live concert that they filmed which uh, there's this <laughs> there's this guy it's where this coffee shop in town and this guy would come in he was one of our regulars and I think he like booked for a couple of blues acts or something like that but you know he was into sports and music and was kind of an encyclopedia with that kind of stuff I remember him I, I still follow him on Facebook and I, I saw a post with him recently he's kind of like is the last waltz like a little bit overhyped in hindsight, like, like it's a, it's a little bit disjointed as a film, particularly as a Scorsese film. You, um, you know, like they start with the last song of the night. That's a bit odd, and you know, everyone seems to kind of overlooked the big Confederate flag in the background of one scene, and so I, it gave me a pause for a minute to kind of sit there and, and really think as I was reading that. I was like, huh. huh. But you know, there's I still some great cuts from it, and and honestly, the. Um, Rob Robertson's Strat is very iconic in that, you know, it's a very unique Strat, like, um, you know, he's got the, the bridge humbucker, no middle pickup at all, and then the next thing will coil. Um, very striking guitar, you know, in that first tune, Don't Do It, you know, a real screaming guitar solo. Um, and so, you know, see what you will about it as a complete work, like my friend had the, uh, the crit critique of, but uh, it's definitely a, an important cultural artifact. So, um, yeah, rest in peace, Robbie Robertson, for sure. Definitely a, a hero of American music. Absolutely. Even as a Canadian, we'll, we'll accept him. Um, so, had to get that out of the way. Had to say something about Robbie, for sure. Um, but I thought I would fill you guys in on some things I've been doing in the last little bit. Um, so, um, one of the, the big kind of things I had kind of recently... Um, was I had two nights of playing solo guitar. Um, so I got connected and had the fortune of, of playing for a VIP event for George Strait. George Strait was just in town. He played at the, the local uh, the local uh, sports ball stadium. And um, I had the opportunity to play um, for a tequila tasting of his tequila brand, Codigo. Um, and basically, I think there was some kind of VIP package where you got VIP tickets, you know, good seats. And you also got to go to this, this tequila tasting. And so, um, so basically, my, my task was to play um, on the, the Friday and Saturday. He was in town each night to play an hour and a half of solo instrumental guitar. Um, and I really do love playing solo instrumental guitar. It's, it's one of my favorite things to do. A lot of my 
recent content on here is is you know kind of jazz chord melody soul arrangements where i'm really just kind of playing like the head you know what i mean i'm not really getting too uh, i'm not like improvising super hard of those I, I have some clips on the website of that www.colinfolton.com the soundcloud link i get to that kind of stuff mostly um via the corporate and wedding groups that i play with sometimes they'll request a solo instrumentalist during dinner or during cocktail hour or something like that um and so i, I enjoy that as like another kind of part of the skill set to have um you know a little lecture on the check which is always nice um you know and, and i really get to you know i don't have like classical repertoire from when i was in school still um so I don't draw from that. So I do kind of lean lean on the jazz kind of thing because that was where I was kind of first exposed to solo guitar via uh, my teacher in high school, Dave Taylor. He was this guy. He um, started with him. He got me for my Belmont audition and kind of introduced me to some jazz standards and things like that. And, you know, he kind of always taught that, you know, there's several different levels of like learning tunes where you can play the melody, you can play the changes, you can improvise, but also having a chord melody where you're playing the melody, but a more embellished, fleshed out version. That was a very important thing to him as far as like being well-rounded and having a grasp on the neck. And um, I really didn't spend a lot of time with that approach. Because um, I kind of did that a little bit and then studied some classical guitar in college. I learned a lot about voice leading in the classical guitar repertoire for sure um that's something that's that kind of sticks with you no matter what kind of style of guitar you're playing or, or what your technique is i think um but um i uh i kind of got back into it a couple years ago i was asked to play just like some hymns and stuff like that uh grandfather's funeral and to also um there's this puerto rican folk tune in mi viejo san juan which i there's also a video on here of me doing that that i posted for uh, I believe some kind of Hispanic Heritage Month or something like that. Um, and so that gig really kind of got me reinterested, or not to call my grandfather's funeral gig, but that occasion rather, and in, in performing like that, and in, in drawing that much sound out of just the guitar, um, really got me kind of reinterested in doing that kind of stuff again. Then I started to get some opportunities um, to play solo for some, some events and things like that. Um, I remember kind of really getting kind of psyched out. I got booked to like just play solo guitar at a wedding once. And um, I had like free range of tunes. I could do whatever I wanted to, but like I really had to go through this mental thing where I really had to like overcome a few mental barriers about, about being so exposed as an instrumentalist. And I really had to kind of reason with the fact that, you know, the audience, the people that, that were at the event that are at the wedding, you know, they're not necessarily guitar players. You know, they're not gonna be listening with the hypercritical ear that the way that I listen to a guitar player. Um, you know, like I think they kind of deferred to an expert, deferred to my best judgment, hired me based off of whatever my qualifications were, the recommendation, and trusted that I knew what I was doing was gonna show up and do a good job. And I really had to also um, kill the guitar jury panel in my head. And so a jury is kind of like, um, it's when your music school, it's basically like a playing exam that you do at the end of every semester. I don't know why they call it a jury, but um, it's basically a panel of, of your, of like your instructor, but also of like the faculty. And usually if you're doing the classical stuff, you have to do some repertoire and from the commercial end, you have to, um, you know, have some selections and some exercises prepared. And then they would ask you to do, you know, I remember specifically there was this one thing where you know we we learned a lot of like drop twos and drop threes and different things and you had to they just picked a chord out of random like play like a flat 13 just go and then play a flat 13 all over the neck and the different versions um it's so really had to remind myself like hey this is not that this gig is like not for a grade like it is for money but like if i make a little cheeky mistake like so what you know like, I don't have this hypercritical audience that's going to be sitting there judging me, you know. And so the hypercritical audience sitting there judging me was between my eyeballs, you know. And so I really, that was a big mental hurdle that I had to get over as far as being comfortable playing solo guitar. Um, 
And so, anyway, so for this particular gig, um, I actually didn't really play any of the jazz stuff. They actually kind of, I think they had this idea that I would just kind of get up there and just kind of strum and be kind of like background music, you know, which, which you know, a lot of soul guitar, let's be honest, in these kind of contexts, I am kind of musical wallpaper, which is fine with me, you know, it's definitely not an ego thing, it's, it's a fun space, I think, to be able to explore and to stretch and to experiment a little bit, and so what I really kind of did was, um, I just kind of improvised, you know, kind of chord melody arrangements of, of, of country tunes, you know, of some George Strait tunes, Chris Stapleton was on the bill as well, so I did a couple of Chris Stapleton tunes, and um, I think it did like some Brooks and Dunn, maybe some Alan Jackson, you know, just, just kind of had fun and just very low key. You know, I took a couple requests, like nothing super crazy, definitely not like a, a lower Broadway, Nashville cover band style request hustle, you know, but if there were I, uh, the couple of people that were close by that were paying attention, I asked if there's anything they wanted to hear, then I kind of went for it and tried to do something like that. So that was a lot of fun. That was very fulfilling, rewarding. I got to actually stay and watch uh, the show on Friday. Uh, Little Big Town open. I forgot how many of their tunes I knew. I unfortunately kind of through the playing the bars. I, I really do kind of lump them and like Lady A and the band Perry. I, I kind of mentally register them all as the same band, which is a pretty ignorant thing. So I was pleasantly surprised to hear tunes like. Um, like uh pontoon and girl crush day drinking and things like that and i was like oh man this band is actually they have some hits you know and then chris Ableton was was incredible he played like 90 minutes hit after hit after hit after hit you know it was really great um and george Strait, i'm not as familiar with his material obviously from playing the clubs i i know like the club tunes for sure um he played two and a half hours i say for about an hour because i uh i wanted to go catch some friends of mine to play but it was really cool. It was I was I was really glad to have had the opportunity from the playing end, you know, and from the gig, but also just to to hear that music as well. That was really great. Um, and then some other things. Um, uh, more gigs with uh, Bad News Barnes in the blues kind of idiom, which was a lot of fun. We've been kind of tweaking the lineup, and we are getting closer to having a really consistent and solid cast of folks that are up to snuff up to his standard and that execute the music well you know kind of one of the things where it's like we have the right group of guys that come in and just by reading the charts which the charts are great but as i mentioned in the previous video just by reading the charts the tunes are 90 percent there so that allows us to really dig in and focus on nuanced stuff with feel and you know they really get into the nitty-gritty uh you know with feel pocket you know instrumentation arrangement all that kind of stuff, you know. Um, um, uh, you go subscribe to my buddy Brian Zach. Um, he, he was the MD on the gig. He talks a little bit about his experience there. He has a couple of clips. He's a YouTube guy as well. He, he was the drummer on that gig. I was very happy to um, to bring him along and to add him into the lineup. He's a cat that's opened several doors for me in town in my career. And it was really cool to be able to dig into that music with him. Um, um so that was really great and there will be more of that stuff um coming on down the line um then uh we had two guys sit in with us there's this group called the blood brothers that were playing the next night at, at the city winery in town um uh it's city and, and blood brothers is mike zito and albert casiglia um mike unfortunately had a pretty tragic um uh, death in the family was unable to make it, so they had a guy named Gary Hoey um, fill in and, and, and step up for Mike um, and, and play his role, you know, singing and playing guitar. And they both sat in and, you know, they each did a tune with us. And it, was, it, was, it was really cool. And then I ended up being able to go see the show the next night and to kind of see them in their thing, you know, kind of reciprocate. You know, they came out to support us, so I wanted to while they were in town and really make the connection and go out and support them as well. And it was really great. And it really kind of reminded me of, you know, a pre the previous video where I talked about being on a gig with two different guitar players. And they were such a great example of that kind of thing done well, because they, um, they both, you know, can play the blues and have a good background in it, but both approach it in kind of two different ways. And, 
and you know have really good chemistry and can both hang on stage but they both like hold their own in a way that really commands the audience's attention um and uh you know like like gary i think comes from more of like the hard rock um kind of kind of school of thought or whatever um and if you look up like his credits and artists and stuff he's played with before and you'd probably see what i mean um and he had a lot of a lot of finesse on the instrument and a lot of you know technique and fluidity and stuff like that he was also playing a shoreline gold strat so that he commented on that when he came and uh came and sat in with us so it was kind of cool to bond with with a really, really great player over over gear and stuff like that you know because i I've, I've never considered myself like a, a super I've never had like a crazy big arsenal of, of super expensive guitars and at points that's been kind of insecurity for me just you know just the 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 modest rig i have versus the crazy rigs that i see other players have and so to kind of connect with a guy on having this uh, a similar guitar was really cool um so see, so yeah, he had this finesse but then albert really had this just really just just insane vibrato and insane phrasing and you know vibrato is a real thing where it's like for me you know i can end a phrase and like play with some pretty nice vibrato or like this doesn't come across as much on acoustic but i i eventually also developed the skill to bend the string and hit vibrato on the end of it but like he would be in the middle of a line and kind of sit on a note for a second and just have the most just like perfect vibrato and then continue and finish the phrase like it just at command he just had it dialed in and i was very impressed by that like that's a, a very nuanced thing that um you know you kind of have to play the instrument and be inside it to, to really understand how, how tough of a thing that is to be able to just at will seemingly you know have right at the tip of your fingers um and so, so yeah, and, and you know, and, and he was playing a Les Paul versus Gary playing the Strat. So it really just two guys that really complemented each other very well. And, you know, it, it led to a very full sound with the band and the, their interplay off each other was, was really great. Um, yeah, I, I really, really, really enjoyed that show. Um, as far as some things coming up, um, I just have uh, some, you know, a private event thing this weekend, some some lower Broadway kind of cover stuff, a bit of teaching. Um, I'm playing with my good friend Stevie Redstone, uh, which I have a, a reel or two or a short, whatever whatever it's called, um, uploaded is uh, from previous gigs with him. Go check out his page as well because um, there's some stuff we did last summer that we filmed in the rehearsal space that we're all really proud of. We tracked. Um, some live stuff a couple months ago in May we had like a, a month-long residency at this club the underdog we'll be releasing some of that at some point down the line um, so if you're in the Nashville area on the 18th come to the five spot I'll be there with CV Redstone we have a pretty good time um, excuse me I had some, some tea kind of coming back up um this is really it for me today i didn't really have much to say in the instructional kind of thing but did want to kind of post more of a, a vlog life update kind of thing um uh so yeah hope you guys enjoy um thank you for watching this thank you for watching the previous stuff please like and subscribe to the video if this is up your alley um as always i'm always um open to you know crowd suggestions if there's something that you guys would like to see me touch more on there's if you guys are sick of these and want me to go back to the chord melody videos and more grateful dead jerry covers that's fine too but uh would love your thoughts on this and on any of these subjects that i discuss at any point in these videos um but i will sign off for now and i will see you guys out there on youtube <laughs>